for seven centuries, the English windmill has graced the landscape, the result of the efforts of our forebears to harness an unpredictable and often dangerous source of power. England's countryside is full of windmills, but the majority are spread throughout the East Midlands, East Anglia, and southeastern England. In March 1830, writer and reformer William Cobbett visited Ipswich and wrote this account of his approach to the town. The windmills on the hills in the vicinity are so numerous that I counted no less than 17. Their twirling altogether added greatly to the beauty of the scene, the most beautiful sight of the kind that I've ever beheld. The earliest documented windmill in England was at Wigston Parva, Leicestershire. A charter of 1137 records that the manor of Wigston Parva and its windmill were given to Reading Abbey. Although the site of the mill is now a pasture, the village church, built about 40 years after the charter, still stands today. We can see how this mill may have looked from illustrations in medieval manuscripts. These are dated about 1340. The whole of the wooden body could be turned on its vertical supporting post to face the wind when it changed direction. These are called post mills. No medieval mills have survived, but Bourne Mill in Cambridgeshire, built in 1636, retains some of their features. As time went by, the supporting substructure of the post mill was enclosed in a brick or wooden roundhouse to protect it and to provide more storage space. This roundhouse belongs to Rawby Mill in North Lincolnshire and was added to the mill early in the 19th century. The original mill was built in the 18th century. The resulting combination is a typical North Midlands post mill. The whole structure of a post mill depends on its vertical post. The post is supported by the four sloping quarter bars, which effectively take the whole weight of the mill. This partnership ensures great rigidity and strength. Above the roundhouse, the top of the post supports the crown tree, the ends of which carry the framing of the body. To turn the mill into the wind, the miller lifted the ladder using a lever called a talva. He then used the tail pole to push the mill around. Some mills had a hand winch fitted, but earlier versions relied solely on the strength of the miller. The ladder was lowered into position afterwards to help with the stability of the mill. The view of the post from inside the body of the mill is almost an optical illusion. Here, the post is actually standing still, while the entire body of the mill and everything inside it is revolving. Below in the roundhouse, the perspective is different. From solid ground, it is clear that the post is standing still, while the mill above is turning. In 1745, Edmund Lee invented the fantail. This is a small set of sails on a wooden frame at the back of the mill, at right angles to the main sails, connecting through a set of reduction gears to wheels on the tail pole. These wheels, and those on the ladder, are carried on two separate tracks encircling the mill. If the wind changes direction, the fan turns, and slowly, so too does the mill. It was quite usual to add a fan tail to an existing mill. This is Jill, partner of Jack, two mills at Clayton-on-the-Downs in Sussex. Jill was originally built in Brighton in 1821, and moved up to her present position by a team of oxen in 1852. Post mills were regarded as movable objects, and many were moved to new sites, some more than once. Stamford Mercury, November 1813, to be sold by private contract, 
a newly erected post mill situated in the populous village of Ilkston. Note well, the mill adjoins a good turnpike road and is also very near the Grand Junction Canal and it might be removed to any part of the kingdom at a trifling expense. Post mills grew larger and larger. Some of the tallest are in Suffolk. This is Saxted Green Mill. The roundhouse has three floors and the body, or buck, as it is known locally, is taller than those in earlier mills. By the 18th century, a new form of windmill had appeared. This was the tower mill. A circular tower of brick or stone replaced the vertical post as the weight-bearing structure and housed the machinery. The top of the mill, or cap, turned to keep the sails into the wind. This is Hanukkah Mill in Sussex. Billingford Mill in Norfolk is an example of an East Anglian tower mill. Also in East Anglia is a tower mill restored by its owner, Chris Wilson. I used to go on cycling holidays looking at various windmills. A lot of the mills, although they were derelict, often the millers still lived there and it often tell you uh, the troubles had during the war years and the difficulties with shortage of timber keeping the mills at work. Also government regulations didn't help the small miller because they demanded a specification of which to mill flour by which was easily met by with rolls but not with millstones. So it gave carte blanche to the roller mills because the millers weren't allowed to mill flour. Nowadays things have changed a lot. Looking at mills now they've passed out of the old families owned by people that are commuters and the mills are nearly always closed during the day because the people are no one no there to show you around. I want to bought the mill, it was quite rotten at the top the cap had blown off and the front hill had been chained up. It entailed uh, re replacing most of the cap, repairing the cap frame, re-leveling the curb, uh, re uh, repairing the floors, one floor had to be entirely replaced, beams as well, and then of, of course the sails. And by about 1965 I got the mill turning herself to wind, and it was two years later when I got the sails, and shortly after that I was milling flour. Why do people collect postage stamps? I want to do caving. It's a sort of something of interest which just appeals to me, whereas other interests appeal to other people. It's a difficult thing to define. I just love windmills. In areas where wood was a traditional building material, especially Kent, the towers of the mills were framed and clad in timber. Windmills with a wooden tower are called smock mills after their similarity to the smock the farm labourers wore. Turning the sails of a smock or tower mill into the wind is little different to turning a post mill. The higher towers meant that the sails could not be manoeuvred from the ground, but the application of the fantail solved this problem. It drove the cap, which revolved around the static tower, on a cast iron curb. Without secure gearing and centering wheels, the cap and sails could be torn off in high winds. The earliest form of sail was a wooden lattice on which a sailcloth of canvas was spread. These are called common sails. Each sail has a twist or weather so that the wind acting upon it produces a force which turns the sails. These sails are at Green's Mill in Nottingham, one of only two windmills to remain in a city and also one of the few tower mills still to use common sails. Notice that each sail is bolted to a large timber beam, the stock, 
which passes through the end of the main or wind shaft. The sailcloth is untwisted and using lines fastened to the edges of the cloth, the sail is set. If the wind increased, the miller would have to stop the mill and put a reef into the sailcloth to reduce the sail area. The various reefs have their own names. First reef, sword point, and dagger point. In 1772, the spring sail was introduced. Its inventor, Andrew Meikle, developed a way of linking all the shutters on a sail to a lever controlled by a spring. It is the spring's tension which closes the shutters. If the wind speed increases too much, the air pressure on the shutters overcomes the spring, allowing the shutters to open. Some of the wind is spilled, preventing the mill from going too fast. However, when he wants to adjust the spring sails, the miller still has to stop the mill and adjust them individually, as with common sails. If the mill is small, the ends of the sails reach close to the ground and they are set from there. Getting close to these sails was one of many hazards for the poor old miller. Stumford Mercury, February 1828. On returning to Clixby's mill Friday last, Mr. Robert Allison was met by a violent hailstorm and unable to see where he was going, he approached too near to the sails of the mill when one of them struck him on the head and he was mutilated in a dreadful manner. He lingered only a few minutes. As mills became taller, they needed a reefing stage to be built out from the tower so that the miller could set the sails. It had to be wide enough to allow the sails to come down inside the railings. The spring sail is less efficient than the common sail, so millers often use one pair of each, like those at Green's Mill. The common sails provide efficiency in light winds, while the spring sails afford a measure of control if the wind should increase. In 1807, the year that Green's Mill was built, William Cubitt, a Norfolk millwright, patented his idea for controlling all the sails on a windmill together. He connected the shutters of the sails together with cranks and rods to a small cross or spider on the front of the wind shaft, which he made hollow. A rod ran from the spider at the front through the wind shaft. This allowed the miller to open and close the shutters via a chain operating a chain wheel and lever at the rear of the mill. Hanging a weight on the chain performed the same function as the spring of a spring sail. The miller could now set and unset all the sails simultaneously, even while they were rotating. As there was now no need to reach the tips of the sails, the reefing stage could be reduced in size or done away with altogether. These sails were known as patent sails and soon became the most popular type of sail in England. This is Cranbrook Mill in Kent. It was built in 1814 for the miller Henry de Bell by the millwright James Humphrey. In 1819, de Bell became bankrupt and the mill was taken over by his creditors who united to run it, hence giving the mill its other name of Union Mill. The millwrights of Lincolnshire and the surrounding area attach the sails directly to the wind shaft using an iron cross. The main spar, or whip, of the sail had to be made bigger to take the additional stresses, but this did away with a large piece of timber that often went rotten inside the canister. An iron cross with more than four arms could be easily made. This gave rise to the five, six, or even eight-sailed mill. The more sails a mill had, the more powerful it is, but as each sail passes through the air, it leaves a wake which interferes with the one following, so reducing the overall efficiency. At the end of the 18th century, John Smeaton found by experiment that a five-sailed mill was the most efficient, and three examples out of seven still survive in Lincolnshire. 
This is the five-sailed mill at Orford, built in 1837. The main disadvantage of having five sails is that if a sail breaks or becomes rotten, the mill is unusable, because with one sail missing, it is unbalanced. A six-sailed mill overcomes this problem, with only a small loss of efficiency, as the opposite sail can be removed and the mill run with four sails. Trader Mill, Sibsey, built in 1877 to replace a post mill, was one of the last mills to be built in Lincolnshire. It is one of only three six-sail mills that have survived. The eight-sailed mill at Heckington originally started life with five sails. In 1890, the eight-sailed Tuxford's mill in Boston was being dismantled. John Pocklington bought and transferred the machinery to Heckington. There were only seven eight-sailed mills in the whole country. And this is the only survivor. Millers used the sails of the mill to signal to each other and to their customers. If the sails were stopped in the St. Andrew's Cross, the miller had finished work for the day. The sails stopped in the St. George's Cross, meant back soon or gone to lunch. The machinery of a post mill is fairly simple. The wind shaft is the central axle which carries the sails and turns the brake wheel. This engages with the stone nut and drives one pair of millstones. The wind shaft continues to the back of the mill where it turns a second wheel, the tail wheel. Here there is space for another pair of millstones. The brake wheel is so called because the brake which is used to stop the mill acts upon it. The brake is the band around the wheel and is controlled by the brake lever. When the mill is working, the brake is kept off by a specially shaped hook. When the miller wants to stop the mill, he gives the rope a quick tug which frees the lever from the hook. So that he can lower the lever applying the brake. The sack hoist uses the power of the mill to raise sacks of grain from the roundhouse up to the bin floor where they are emptied into the bins prior to grinding. Inside the cap of a smock or tower mill, there is a wind shaft and brake wheel, as in a post mill. But the brake wheel does not drive the stones directly. Instead, it drives a gear wheel called the wallower, which turns the upright shaft, taking the power down the middle of the tower to the stone floor. The top floors of a tower mill are usually for storing the grain. Below them, is the stone floor where the grinding is done. The stones are driven by the shaft or quant with the small gear or stone nut near the top. This gear is driven by the great spur wheel on the upright shaft. In some areas of the country, windmills follow watermill practice in having their stones driven from below. Here at Downfield Mill in Soham, Cambridgeshire, is a typical underdriven arrangement. The stone nuts are lowered down the stone spindles by a wooden winch system. The great spur wheel is nine feet in diameter and has 148 wooden teeth. Each tooth fits accurately through the wooden rim of the spur wheel. Wooden tooth gear wheels often had an extra tooth 
or hunting cog, so that the same teeth would not engage with each other on each revolution. If one or two teeth were harder or softer than the others, the inequality in the wear would put strain on the machinery. Even when the gear wheels were iron, the driven teeth were usually wooden. This made the gears quieter. The wooden teeth took most of the wear and were easier and cheaper to replace. If something jammed, then they would break, acting as a safety device. Apple or pear wood was used for the teeth, as the wood is dense and hard wearing. In a functional mill like Green's mill, the traditional milling process can still be observed. After setting the sails, our miller, David Bent, goes up to the stone floor to put the stones into gear. He engages the stone nut by sliding out the wooden block from the bearing and pushing the two sets of teeth together. Then he replaces the block to hold the top of the quant in place. Green's mill is a typical example of an overdriven mill with its spur wheel above the millstones. David must then go down to the ground floor to operate the sack hoist, which takes the sacks of grain through the trapdoors up to the top of the mill. At intervals, along the chain, there are smaller chains with rings at their ends. David slips the chain through the ring, forming a noose which goes over the neck of the sack. To raise the sack, he pulls on the rope which engages the drive. Once the grain is at the top of the mill, gravity feeds it down through the various processes. David has to climb to the top of the mill and the first thing he does is empty the bags into a grain cleaner. In the past, the biggest problem for the miller was disease in the grain, such as smut, which discolored the flour. Today, with bulk handling, the main worry is foreign objects passing through the system. This Bobie grain cleaner was built in 1935. It has three metal sieves, which remove large objects and weed seeds and shriveled grains. As the grain falls down the spout on its way to the floor below, the fan at the bottom of the machine gives it an upward blast of air, which blows any remaining debris into the expansion chamber. On the floor below, the clean grain shoots into a large bin. The floor below the bin floor is the stone floor. Here, David checks the flow of grain into the hopper before he starts up the mill. Another floor down, David must put a clean sack over the spout to catch the flour. The sails are set, the stones are in gear, the grain has been cleaned and the wind is blowing. So it's time for David to release the brake and get underway. The grain comes out of the bottom of the hopper and into the shoe which is being shaken so that the flow of grain is proportional to the speed of the mill. The angle of the shoe can be adjusted from the meal floor to ensure that the rate of milling is consistent with the amount of power that the wind is providing. When the millstones are turning, the grain enters the stones at the middle. These furrows take the grain between the stone. The pattern of furrows on the bottom stone or bed stone and that on the top stone or runner stone scissor the grain open releasing the flour. The flat parts between the stones actually do the grinding. As the stones are used they wear away especially towards the outside where the speed is greatest. To regain their efficiency, they must be levelled and the furrows recut if necessary. This is called dressing the stones. The staff is a piece of mahogany used to check that the furrows are level. The working face of the staff is in turn checked for level against the proof 
a piece of cast iron with its top section machined flat. A mixture of iron oxide and water called raddle is applied to the staff, which is then rubbed over the face of the millstone. This shows up any high spots. This is the implement for removing the high spots revealed by the staff. The double-edged chisel is called a mill bill and is held by a wedge in a wooden handle called a thrift. Today the mill bill is tipped with tungsten carbide and is extremely hard. In times past it was made of steel and needed frequent resharpening on a grinding wheel. After a short time the hard tip would be worn away and a fresh one needed. To dress a pair of stones, about 24 mill bills were required. They were then sent to the millwrights, or blacksmith, who would re-temper them for use next time. As he worked, small pieces of stone and metal would fly up and hit the stone dresser's hand, embedding themselves there. If a miller wanted to know if someone was experienced at stone dressing, he would ask to see his hand, or show his metal. There were two common types of stone used as millstones. Derbyshire or grey stones were quarried in the English Peak District and were used to mill animal feed and wholemeal flour. The other type came from an area near Paris and was therefore called French stone. This was a very hard stone which was used for flour production. Unlike the grey stones, it produced large flakes of bran which could be easily sieved out. The furrows also help the flour to the outside of the stones, where it falls into the gap between the bedstone and the tun, the wooden casing. From here, it falls down a spout into the sack on the floor below. The meal floor is where the milling is controlled. The runner stone is supported by the stone spindle, the shaft you can see passing through the bedstone. The stone spindle is supported in turn by the bridge tree, a beam that has one end fixed and one end carried by the tentering screw. By turning the tentering screw, the gap between the stones can be varied, making the flour coarser or finer at will. However, the fineness of the flour alters as the speed of the stone changes, so the governor varies the gap between the stones to keep the fineness constant. David now won't leave the meal floor for an hour or so, while the stones warm up. Then he will check the amount of grain in the bin and the hopper. David has shown us the stages of milling basic wholemeal flour. There's always been a demand for a less heavy loaf of bread made from flour that has some of the bran removed. The first machine to be used for this process was the bolter. An operational bolter remains inside Heckington Mill. The flour enters a rotating cloth cylinder which is slightly slack so that the cloth sags as it rotates and rubs against the beta bars. These knock the fine flour through the cloth into the spouts below. To increase efficiency and to provide a whiter flour, different forms of flour machines were tried. Here at Wissendine Mill, Rutland, are a pair of reels. The flour is taken up the side of the reel by centrifugal force until it falls and hits the bottom with sufficient force to send the fine particles through the cloth. In the wire machine at Orford Mill, the flour is rubbed through a cylindrical wire sieve by rotating brushes. Beaters revolving at high speed throw the flour against the sieve in the centrifugal flour dresser at Downfield Mill. This is what flour dressers produce. From 100% wholemeal flour comes 85% wholemeal with 15% of the bran taken out. Or 
untreated white flour with all the bran and semolina extracted. Four grain flour and rye flour, a much lighter flour with a different flavor, are just two of the speciality flours available. Millers found it difficult to remove all traces of bran from the flour until roller milling was introduced in the 1880s. Here at Wissendine Mill is a pair of very early rollers. These are porcelain. It was thought that a finer flour would be produced using porcelain rather than steel. However, the steel ones last much longer and are in universal use today. To help out on calm days, many millers installed auxiliary power. Downfield Mill originally had a steam engine for when the wind failed. Then it used a diesel engine, later on a tractor, and now electricity. The advent of steam-powered roller mills at the ports, using cheap imported wheat from Australia and the New World, sounded the death knell for the windmill. By 1900, competition was severely affecting farmers and small-scale millers. Many millers gave up flour production and concentrated on animal feed. Finally, in 1916, due to wartime shortages, the government decreed that all flour should be of a fixed extraction rate, something impossible with stones, but quite easy using rollers. So flour milling by wind ceased altogether. After the war, the market for stone ground flour had vanished and could not be revived. Even those mills which had a good trade in animal feed found that the expense of repairs and maintenance ate into profits. Rotten sails were taken off and not replaced or just left there. Whether a mill survived or not depended on the stubbornness and resources of the miller. We've been looking for a mill for years and um, we wrote to Jack Pollard, who owned the mill in those days, um, to see if he wanted to sell the mill. Uh, at that point he didn't, because he was trying to develop the rest of the site. And then out of the blue, about two years later, uh, he, his solicitors wrote saying, do you still want it? And we popped down one Saturday morning and uh, ended up buying a windmill. And uh, it's sort of gone from there. It has to be self-supporting from the flour and the uh, visitors that we get in the summer months. The first mill is supposed to have dated from 1726. Um, that date, it was not like it is now a brick mill, but a wooden tower. Around about 1887, um, it was severely damaged in a um, very high wind. And what they did was they propped the mill up, the floors and everything, and replaced the wooden tower in brick to the form that you can see now and it then ran continuously up to the late 50s when the fantail fell off. They ran for a few more years with the auxiliary tractor power and then finally it stopped in the mid 60s um, and we rebuilt the cap in aluminium which was easier and more practical. Uh, then we had the interesting job of getting the sails off and they were so rotten and one couldn't do it in a controlled manner. One just simply put a saw through at the centre and hoped they'd land in the right place. Um, having done that, we then put a new fantail on the back and uh, we got grinding in April 1980. I've always been fascinated by windmills ever since I can remember. It's a sort of battle between you and the elements. You've got a variable source of power. You've got to somehow turn that into some useful work. And it's a question of balancing the wind speed you've got, against the type of grain you're grinding, and to produce a, a useful meal at the end of it. If I knew then what I know now, I possibly would do it again, but it's, uh, it's not easy and it's a lot of hard work, and there's not a lot of money to be made out of it. <laughs> Since medieval days, millers have had a bad press. From Norman times, everyone was obliged to use the local mill owned by the feudal landlord. As payment, 
the miller would take a portion by volume of the flour produced, a system which was open to abuse by the miller. An honest miller found it hard to prove he had not cheated his customers, as the volumes of the grain and the finished product were different. The serf or freeman may have felt hard done by, but he could not take his custom elsewhere without being fined. Is the miller and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales a true likeness or a stereotype? The miller was a chap of sixteen stone, a great stout fellow big in brawn and bone. A wrangler and a buffoon, he had a store of tavern stories, filthy in the main. His was a master hand at stealing grain. He felt it with his thumb, and thus he knew its quality, and took three times his due. Jibes about the integrity of a miller could even follow him to his grave. Epitaph on an Essex miller named Strange. Here lies an honest miller, and that is strange. If the old-time miller seemed to play hard, he also lived hard as well. In living memory, wheat was handled in sacks of 18 stone, two stone more than the brawny miller himself. If there was work and the wind was blowing, the miller would start the mill as early as possible on Monday morning and run until Saturday evening, Sunday, of course, being the day of rest, unless the wind blew and he had customers waiting. Stamford Mercury, August 1817. On the 23rd, Edward Chumley of Nottingham, Miller, was fined five shillings and costs for exercising his worldly calling of a miller during divine service on Sunday the 21st. Apart from the miller himself, there would be a lad or apprentice learning the trade. The assistant would help with jobs that required two people, such as hoisting sacks up the mill, or taking the horse and cart to deliver flour, or collect more grain. The miller had to tend to the needs of the mill, filling the hoppers, removing the filled sacks, and keeping an eye on the wind direction. He usually worked for as long as the wind blew, and there was grain to be ground, only taking catnaps on the sacks when he could. Small wonder, then, that there were accidents. Stamford Mercury, January 1841. On the 12th, Mr. Freer of Mansfield Woodhouse, whilst working in his windmill, was caught in the shaft and had his body mangled so as to cause his death. When discovered in this dreadful situation, the mill was still going. Doncaster Gazette, October 1836. On Tuesday morning, very early, Nottingham was visited with a very high wind which at seven o'clock blew down a mill at Snenton. The miller was inside at the time and was very severely hurt. Windmills were not just used for producing flour. Any process that needed power could be driven by wind, grinding pigments for paint, crushing seeds to extract oil, sawing timber and pumping water. The windmills of the Norfolk Broads are actually wind pumps which kept the marshes free of water. The fens also had hundreds of wind pumps to drain the fertile soils. This small one at Wickham Fen, Cambridgeshire, is one of the last. Although the English windmill conforms to a general plan, there are notable regional styles. In Norfolk, it is the boat-shaped cap. Lincolnshire mills have the OG-shaped cap and tend to have more than four sails. Suffolk has a county of large post mills, while Kent has numerous smock mills. The subtle differences between post mills like Jill Mill and Rawby Mill show how unique each mill is. These differences in style and form were brought about by the men who built the mills, the millwrights. Each one brought his own individuality to the area in which he lived and worked. One of the few surviving firms of millwrights is R. Thompson and Son, just down the road from the mill at Orford, Lincolnshire. Today, the firm is run by Jim and Tom Davies. The work of the millwright consists of maintaining all parts of the windmill, except the brickwork. We do odd bits of brickwork, but any large amount we engage a builder. 
but then we have to restore or repair the caps, fan tail, fan boards, sails have to be replaced occasionally as required. In between times they have to be maintained, painted, and any other repair work carried out. First Robert Thompson came here in 1877 to run the business, followed Wheatcroft. Wheatcroft in turn had followed Sam Oxley, who was reputed to have built some of the local mills. Well, I was in related out the forces in the wartime. I came back here in 1945, taken on a month's trial by Jack Thompson. After 28 years, I had to ask him if it was going to be a permanent job. A lot of the mills were dismantled in that time, went into disuse and disrepair. The millers couldn't afford to repair them, so they were demolished. Yes, the trend now is to have the mills restored. Local government and central government are more inclined to spend money on them. People are taking advantage of the grants available, and a lot more mills are being restored. My well, son Tom runs the business now, but the future looks secure. I've worked here now for just over 18 years and covered most aspects of work, sails, caps, fan tails, machinery inside the mill from total restoration jobs to routine maintenance work. These are four sails that were made for a small smock mill in Cambridge here and they've taken us approximately five weeks to make them in the yard to the stage they are now and if the weather isn't suitable in the yard for making them in the open we have a temporary cover which we can put over them to enable us to carry on working. We spend most of the autumn and winter preparing materials and components ready for spring and summer of the following year making shutters for sails and making sails depends what job we're on as to what requires to be done. Most of the mills you've seen have been derelict or have needed extensive repairs in the last 30 years. Green's Mill was restored by Nottingham City Council and is in its care. Trader Mill, Sibsey and Saxton Green Mills have been restored and are cared for by English Heritage. The fate of some mills is to be turned into houses, which must give new meaning to the experience of high-rise living. Today, most of the restored mills are open to the public. The visitor can experience the thrill of seeing a machine driven by an untamed natural force and see the ancient skill of flour milling, providing the wind is blowing, of course. Renewed interest in natural sources of power has caused a new form of windmill to appear in the landscape, generating electricity. Each wind turbine can provide the power for 250 to 300 households, and the British Wind Energy Association believes that by 2010, 10% of electricity could be generated this way. Although the electricity produced by wind turbines is more expensive than that produced by fossil fuels or nuclear power, it has no hidden costs, such as acid rain, radioactive waste, or greenhouse gas production. Because of their impact on the landscape, wind turbines have had a mixed reception, which may mellow with time. Boat owners, too, are taking advantage of this power by using small wind generators, like this one, to charge their batteries while they're in harbour or at sea. In a time when most foods come unfailingly from the supermarket, the English windmill is a reminder of the time when all man's ingenuity and resources were focused on the need to produce his daily bread. That the result was such a graceful machine which still decorates the landscape is a tribute to those who built and ran the English windmill.